soup spoon. If you listen, you might hear her up there, grandmother of the top drawer, laughing about the way life slipped from her like a chicken noodle. In another time, she was the bright-eyed floozy of the dining room, but her heart was too big. She gave it all away. Now she spends long hours in the crumb-lined corner, remembering her days with the Delft blue plate, how they ran away together and caused such a stir, the cook jumped over the moon. But he was fragile, the Delft blue, fell to pieces at a family bash, leaving her alone. Oh, she's had her fling since then, taken out to serve rice and beans or lift the green from an avocado. And one autumn, she went to the garden to make holes for a hundred tulip bulbs. But in recent years, it's the grandchildren. Their small hands reach for her on rainy afternoons. She still gives all she has, her tarnished face beneath the golden broth, a mirror to soften our world. Magdalene faces the tribunal of quantifiable evidence and measurable outcomes. Magdalene speaks. Yes, it is possible, I suppose, that he hypnotized us, and we only imagined ourselves in those silent depths, that he tricked our minds into peace and our bodies into ease, created the illusion that we were whole, and yes, perhaps we merely felt as if we were loved, with abandon. He smelled like rain, and his voice made my bones hum like a thousand dulcimers. Yes, it was probably an imaginary wind that brought us to his feet and blew us back into lives that are now somehow on fire. And I suppose one could make the case that he faked the whole thing that he was just like the rest of us, lost, tiny as a grain of rice in a bubbling kettle of stars. He may have only brought laughter to our days and dancing to our feet, only made it seem a blessing to be alive. No, sirs, I have nothing to show. None of us got rich or made ourselves a name. But I often find my pillow is wet when I wake in the night and think of him. Undertow. The great whales, they say, once cavorted on land, their closest cousin, the dairy cow. But these homesick bovines waddled back to the sea, foreleg morphing to fin, hind leg to fluke. And so this is the story of a sea creature wrapped in her own warmth and how her heart grew to the size of a small cathedral so that when she sang, the notes became round and traveled in rings. But first, this is the story of a cow, heavy with barley and wheat, fed up with gravity and heat, about the call she barely heard in the murmur of the sea, how her wobbly legs seemed to carry her on their own, gingering down over boulder and shale to the shore. For a few glory days, she cooled her hooves in the shallows and nibbled on seaweed, but the call insisted from deeper down and away so that one day she strode into the breakers, her great head lifted up, huge nostrils drinking in air, and then the ocean floor fell out and she drifted down in a slow motion paddle, buoyed by something strange yet familiar, thick, echoing, tasting of salt. Juvenile Hall. Giovanni is not in poetry class today. He's in lockup, chants my wayward Greek chorus, and for a moment he's conjured up out of the hole. Standing there in his orange sweats, 
all 17 years, six and a half feet of him. Cockeyed grin, incandescent globe of hair, hands dangling like shoes tossed over a telephone wire. Funny how the Freedom Riders always gallop full steam into lockup. The ones whose poetry we love, who can turn the sky into a rainbow trout, serve it up with a hot sauce of snow. Funny how his presence tastes more like wind than a room with no mattress or windows. More like a gust of laughter, so sweet and clear, even the guards close their eyes to hear. Spell. Before the alphabet was snatched up by the mind, it belonged to the body. Consonants huddled in the crooks of elbow, ankle, and knee, where they thrived on gossip and potluck dinners, built cities and jazz clubs with intricate webs of phone line and highway. But the vowels, moon-driven and drunk on the sound of their own voices, lived alone in the hollows and caves. O, oh, the emperor of solitude, built his hut in the dome of the belly. With wingspan and vision of an eagle, I made his nest in the brows. You, the hermit thrush, hid her rubies in the isthmus of the throat. And the lioness E staked claims on the mouth, raising her cubs in intermittent light. But it was A, wild and lovely, who hold up in the heart, caught in the spell of awe, in the awe of a waiting, of awkward and a flame, in the nearly inaudible awe of being folded into the arms of the lover without a face. <laughs> 